So I, um, when I told a lot of you what I was thinking about doing last year, um, I received a lot of support from and encouragement from a lot of you. And I just want to start by saying thank you for that. Uh, it's meant a real lot to me. Um, I especially want to thank Joe Little and Lisa Mendelson for their encouragement and support. And also in the Sunrise Club, John Seacrest and Nick Dubois have been really helpful to me. And so I'm just feeling uh, very much encouraged and supported by um, by all of you who have um, you know, expressed encouragement and thoughts. So I, I'm just really grateful for that. And, and I feel it's really special. So thank you. Um, I'm also kind of excited to share this with you because you know me. And, um, and when I get to talk to people about this, they often don't know me or if I've written stuff on my website, it's writing for people that don't know me um, and I don't know them. So I know you and I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to you about this. I feel like it's kind of a unique opportunity maybe for some dialogue. I'm still really setting my direction and learning how to do things. And so I hope that, that you see things that I don't see and feel comfortable telling me and suggesting things. Um, I'm really still very new at all of this. So I, I hope it really, you can feel comfortable explaining if I don't make sense or um, if you've got an idea for me. Um, so I wanna tell you about what I've been doing. I wanna tell you about why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it with um, some examples. <clears throat> so let's see, did that advance to the next slide for you? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> I can tell you um, that what I've been doing is um, a few different things. And it's basically when somebody loses a loved one, I'm uh, there to help them with the many practical tasks that need to get done when somebody passes. Uh, and the other thing that I've been doing is that I help people get their affairs in order towards the end of their life. So that's basically um, what I've been doing. And I'm going to tell you a little more in detail. So when someone you love dies, you know that there's a lot of things that need to be done um, right away. So planning the funeral, securing the property, utilities, collecting all the financial details, securing assets, the will, the lack of will. There are a lot of things to do right away um, after somebody passes. Um, and if, if you've had to do this for someone you've lost or know someone who has died recently, um, you know how hard this can be. And it's usually very exhausting. Um, many people just force themselves through this and they, they, just, they just struggle on. Um, but if you could imagine what you would like to feel like after dealing with the loss of a loved one, um, what, might you, what might you want to focus on? Um, the best that I've seen is that people really want to be able to mourn. They want to be able to celebrate the best of, of that person's life. They want to be able to remember their loved one. And uh, they want to be able to focus and sometimes refocus on what is important in their own lives. And um, I've been to some funerals where I leave the funeral feeling better about life and more focused on what's important to me um, than when I went into that funeral. And um, I'm guessing that some of you have felt that way too. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that get in the way of being able to do this. And it's even harder when you're really close to the person because the, it can be so hard and so raw. Um, but I think it is possible. And I think that's one of my goals. Um, more practically, just after somebody passes, it can be helpful if somebody uh, dies who has children who are out of state um, or when the person who's left to handle the details is really busy or challenged uh, for medical issues or for whatever reason, um, I can uh, help people take care of things in those practical situations. Um, the next thing that I can do is help people when uh, they are the executor of an estate. Um, as you might know that the tasks that you do when you're an executor can last for a year or sometimes two years or more. Um, and it can be really complicated. They can really have a full-time job uh, just executing the will. And it's, uh, you know, usually somebody who doesn't have a degree in that job and are probably doing another job or a lot of other things with their lives. So um, being an executor can be really hard. And I'm learning all the ins and the outs of the executor role so that I can guide somebody through the process uh, with ease. Um, and again, practically speaking, if the executor lives out of state, if they're challenged to handle the many tasks for medical or whatever reasons, I can help them 
um, by walking them through the process and overcoming those practical limitations. Um, I've learned that some people set up their estates to pass on easily to those that they love, um, and that can make the role of the executor much easier. Uh, some people think that they are setting up their estates to pass on easily, but are missing some small things which can turn into big things. And uh, a lot of people who really don't want to think much about it aren't doing much at all. Um, maybe they are writing a will uh, to name a person who's going to be stuck with a lot that's left behind. Um, so there's, there's people in, in many different um, categories, and we can talk a little bit more about that um, as I go. I'm working with a client right now whose father was not well prepared to die, and the son is struggling to get everything taken care of. Uh, it has to do with the house and the physical assets, the debts, the scattered financial information. There was no will, uh, so probate is challenging. He had to get a probate bond. Um, who here even knows what a probate bond is? I thought that was a, an interesting thing to learn about. Um, he's handling a lot and he's trying to live his already very full and challenging life. And he's happy to have uh, the peace of mind of knowing that he's on the right track, that he's not missing anything and he's getting everything done and he's doing it right. Um, so I'm happy to work with him. Um, next thing I do is um, I help people prepare for the end of their life. Um, one of my clients uh, sees that her mother is not well prepared and she's getting much older. And so she's hiring me, the daughter is, to work with her mother. And the mother's happily agreed um, to get things in order without having to do the hard work of figuring out everything by herself. Um, the daughter obviously wants to make sure that things are in order for herself so that when the time comes, she'll know that things are done correctly, that money won't be wasted because of um, poor decisions and that things will be easy. Uh, but she also really wants her mother to have the peace of mind knowing that she doesn't have to think of it anymore. So it's a, it's a really nice gift that she's giving to her mother um, and uh, which is really the gift of allowing her mother to know that it's all handled so she can focus on what's important to her. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm not. <laughs> um, I'm not a therapist, a financial advisor, an attorney, a funeral director, a real estate agent, uh, an appraiser, an auctioneer. Um, and while I'm not any of these things, I can discuss them all. And I know when to refer someone to uh, these professionals, which we have some wonderful ones in our, in our area, as you know. Um, but I've helped someone find a counselor during this challenging time to find a counselor. Um, I've worked with someone, um, I'm working with someone right now who's working with their lawyer and their financial advisor, and I'm helping them uh, manage those meetings. I've secured the services of a real estate agent. Um, I've gotten a dumpster to clear out things that are value that are left behind and help fill that dumpster. Um, and I'm working with an appraiser to get things ready to sell. Um, so those are some of the things that, um, that I am doing. And um, it might be a good time to just pause for a moment and ask if there's any questions before I kind of jump into the why. I'll jump into the why. So oh, wait a minute. I've got a question. Okay, Liz. Liz Harrison. Hi. But do people um, sign up with you a long time ahead of time or at the time of or what? Um, all of the above there. So um, for, for people who um, have just recently lost somebody, they can call, call me then. Um, I've had uh, a person who's um, their parent passed away four or five months ago, and then they called me because they were struggling to figure out how to execute the will and get all of those things done. Um, and like I said, there's the, uh, that daughter that um, wanted me to work with her mother and her mother's, you know, her mother's not going to die anytime soon. Um, so, and there's another woman who wanted um, things more organized and, and she's she's in her 60s and she's in good health um so uh, i guess that i think that answers your question yeah yeah thanks good question hey, hey ron yes so given the things you don't do lawyer and things like that then is your footprint where you're providing this service pretty much the tri-state region the counties say or within the 100 miles or something what do you perceive your market area to be yeah, I, that's a good question. I don't really have a great answer for that. Um, you know, with the advent of Zoom, I'm, I'm helping somebody up in St. Albans right now. 
And um, I wouldn't have really thought that would have been possible when I first started doing this, but that's been really easy and successful. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not able to travel all over the place, but, um, but I can do a lot from remotely, uh, which has been kind of fun to discover. So I guess I'll say the simple reason um, why I wanted to do this, because some of my friends have said, why on earth would you want to do anything having to do with uh, death or end of life? <laughs> and um, I guess I like to be with people when they are dealing with hard things and uh, with life's big concerns. Um, and I like providing practical support to people. Um, so I like to listen to people and hear what their issues are, but then I kind of want to like just get down and help them get things done that will be really helpful for them. Um, for example, I'm, uh, for example, I'm working with a client who recently lost her father and she's overwhelmed around, um, a lot of things right now, including having to move her apartment, which was quite large. Um, so I helped her, uh, by, uh, doing this thing that she just had a mental block and couldn't do. And that was to ask her friends to help her to move. So I sent up, set up a big, um, doodle poll and opportunity for her friends to, to plug in a schedule for when they were going to come and help her move, uh, help her pack. And um, so that was a real practical example of something that I could, I could do to help somebody. And then she had more time to think about, um, you know, just dealing with the loss of her dad. Um, the more philosophical reason of why I'm interested in doing this is um, revolves around life and death. And I'm kind of excited to talk to you about this because it's hard to communicate to strangers about this. It's really personal and hard and, um, and yet we know each other. So I feel a little more comfortable trying to explain it to you. Um, it's not easy to talk about uh, our own death. And I think that we all have moments though, then we are have moments of clarity and we look at death for what it is. And I think these are our more contemplative moments I know I don't do it enough, but when I do, I understand that my life and my death are kind of one thing. Um, there's no such thing of life without death and there's no such thing as death without life. And when I take my own death seriously, I find that I make better choices about the way that I'm living right now. Um, <clears throat> another way to say this is, um, is to look at this arc and to say that when I was younger, I lived kind of like my life was on this kind of an arc. I thought things would just go on and on and get better and better and bigger and bigger. Um, I'd be able to play soccer forever, disc golf forever, <laughs> uh, be able to run my business forever, uh, be able to be with and see my kids forever. Um, but I know that this really isn't the way that things go. Um, and we all know this, but it's sometimes hard to accept this. Um, and when I'm at my best, I think of my arc more as something like this, which doesn't look as fun. <laughs> but at any point, you know, you're, you're somewhere on this arc. And, but I think it's closer to reality. And when I live my life like it looks like this, I can live each moment on that arc well because I recognize that that each moment is a part of a whole. And that whole is a realistic whole. It's not like a dream of something that's not actually going to be. Um, but I can live each moment knowing this is, you know, this is one day before, before, you know, I turn 110 or whatever it is when I'm lucky enough to, um, to pass away. And I can live it, live it more to its fullest, I think, when I recognize the whole as what it is. Um, my father used to joke with me when he, um, that he wanted to spend all of his money before he died and, um, that he, um, he'd say that if he did it great, you know, he'd be spending his last penny on his, on his very last day. And I think he was trying to encourage me to start saving for my own retirement and not to rely on him at all. Um, but kidding aside, I think there was some wisdom hidden in that joke, um, and we all know the other joke that um, he who dies with the most stuff wins. Um, and I feel like that's kind of living on that 
that other arc, you know, that arc, which is sort of a dream that um, we're heading towards just God knows what, something massive and huge, but that's not really the way it goes. Um, I think something which might be better would be to say that um, he who dies with no stuff wins or with just the right amount of stuff. <laughs> Not that stuff is the most important thing to think about. But um, we know that when we die, we're going to have to let go of our life. There's no way to practice this, thankfully. But we know we're going to have to let go. And I've heard it said that our body's aging is kind of practice for that. When we look at letting go of certain things, certain faculties, our, our movement, our memories, it's kind of like practice for letting go for the end. And when I accept this, I'm a happier person. You know, <clears throat> when I'm playing soccer and I'm playing like I know that I'm a lot slower than I used to be. <laughs> I'm a lot less likely to foul people near me because I'm getting frustrated that I'm slow. <laughs> and when I accept that my body is, is slowing down, I'm able to live happier each moment right now. Um, I choose to play goalie now instead of forward, <laughs> for example, and I'm happier that way. And as we age, we slowly let go of our health. And I think this can be training for us for, for how we ultimately let go. And by the time that I die, I want to have learned to let go of everything, my belongings, my health, and even my life. And I want to be able to hold on to what is most important to me, which for me, what is most important is who I love, my hopes I have for my family, and our community, and our society, and my faith that all things are going to be well. And those are the only things that I really, really, really want to hold on to. Even if I have dementia someday and I, and I am not thinking clearly, I hope that somehow I've incorporated those things that I love and that I hope for and that I have faith in somehow in my body so that even if I'm, my mind is somewhat gone, I hope I still have those things. Maybe that's unreasonable to hope for. And I know Maggie Lewis, who knows a lot about dementia, could probably counsel me on that, but that's what I hope for. There are a lot of things, though, that distract me. They distract me from focusing on what is important. And I know this seems like a long tangent, but it's really kind of important for me to explain this because it's the real why of, of why I'm doing this. <clears throat> it's kind of the essence because I'm helping people deal with things that are distracting them from what is most important to them. And I'm doing that around the topic of end of life because when we are so distracted from thinking about our end of life issues, or we are so distracted that we, until we absolutely have to face it, or until we look at it for what it is, look at death for what it is and start planning for it and living each day like a piece of that whole that includes the end of our life. So I'm working with a client right now who is thinking um, about their end of life and feeling unsettled about how things are organized. And we're putting together what's known as a legacy drawer right now. And so this is I'm kind of, uh, oh yeah, I, I threw this in there. Um, because I feel like that's kind of how you need to live every day. Have you seen this, um, this, this dog before? I love the crazy look in his eyes as he's um, running out. But I want to talk about how and, and this example about this client can help me explain it a little bit. Um, I'm putting together a legacy drawer for her. And this drawer has a, a water and fireproof envelope that contains all the information that someone would need in the event of her death. Uh, she's getting her will done, um, her advanced care directive. Uh, she's figuring out what charities she wants to focus upon. And I'm putting together what's called a letter of intent or a letter of instruction, which details all the things that aren't in the will. And, and there's a lot. And we're putting together, um, it, it's a lot of, it's, it's not hard work putting it together, but it's, uh, it's not easy to figure out what to do either unless you've done it before. And it's kind of uncomfortable stuff to deal with, as we know. So having someone to walk through it with her has been really helpful. 
Um, and the end goal is peace of mind so she can focus on what is important. She wants to focus on her health and enjoying each day. And she wants to eliminate the distraction of her fear of death and her anxiety about what is going to happen when she dies. My client who's trying to sell his father's house wants to consider his relationship with his father, which is complicated, but that's really what he wants to be dealing with. He doesn't want to be distracted by the trash hauling, the real estate agent, the probate bond, the bills, on top of all of the other things going on in his life. He wants to think about him and his dad and how they had a hard relationship and what does it mean now that his dad is gone. Um, a client of mine's brother passed away and she had a complicated relationship with him. She felt kind of thrust into the process of acting as the administrator of his estate and she needed help focusing on what was important, removing the distraction of her complicated relationships with him and his children. And we were able to talk it through and make a good plan for how she was going to deal with the will. And so that's really where I want to be able to help people is to help them identify their distractions, take them off their plate for them so they can focus on what's important. So that's where I'm at with um, my business right now. And I, um, I'd be curious to hear if you have any questions, thoughts, suggestions for me. Um, I really want to, um, to see where, where this is going to go. I feel very uh, fortunate. I'm um, as you probably know, I'm doing fundraising consulting right now and in an executive director consultant. Um, and so those things are paying the bills and, um, and I'm free to sort of allow this business to grow um, slowly and as, as time allows so that I can learn and then um, and be more of help to more people later on. So any questions? It's interesting, Rob, um, having dealt with a couple of family members' wills and how to do, how we do, how to decide. Uh, it, I think it's quite a valuable service that you can't really do when you're alive. And I'm going to use my mother's as an example, and you can kind of expound how you go about this. But you know, she didn't really leave a will, so she had a lot of things. A lot of things went into the dumpster. Uh, but then how do you decide among four siblings how you divvy that up? I happened to end up being the executor and I just said, we'll get an appraisal and then you divide the total by four. That's your kitty. And uh, we'll flip coin. I don't remember how he decided who picked first, but you pick something and the value of that item comes off your kitty. And the house was included. That was a big item, but that just got divided four ways. But that in itself, I can see where uh, once you can actually explain it so someone can understand it, because even if you have a will, you're not going to list all those things. That in itself, maybe you could talk about that aspect yeah. um, as you see it, because it's, it's the politics of it amongst the family didn't go well for a while. Yeah, it's, it's super hard. And that is, I think, a very, very common uh, struggle for a lot of people. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there is that, that it, letter of instruction or, or letter of intent is a good place for somebody to document a lot of their wishes, um, which, you know, the will, if there's any ever any conflict with the will, the will supersedes. Um, but that letter of intent can really be used to describe your wishes. Um, I've seen some letters of intent that say, and the reason she's not getting anything <laughs> is this, you know, that's not something you'd put in a will. Um, but, you know, it does allow you to say, you know, I'm, I'm leaving things to Carl and I'm hoping that he's going to use this system in order to um, organize how to deal with it. You know, even if it's something as simple as that, that, that can help, um, ease some of the, the pain and the struggle um, of divvying things up. Um, and, you know, every family is different and the things are different. You know, some families uh, struggle dividing things. And I've seen some families say like, okay, there's a lottery, you get pick number one, you go pick an item from the house. <laughs> and, you know, you know, your sister goes next and 
the other sister goes last, you know, and then you just kind of rotate through. Um, but that's not going to work for everybody. And so I think if you can set it up ahead of time in a letter of intent or instruction, then people can honor their wishes um, more easily. And, and it could be, I suppose, a video either to the group or individual videos to each, um, sort of like a post conference. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have other questions? Rob, it's Liz Harrison. I really applaud what you're doing. I know what we went through when my parents died and um, I don't want my husband to have to go through that or me and vice versa or if my son predeceases us uh, or his. And uh, I just applaud what you're putting together. I don't think you're gonna have any problem building this business. Thank you, Liz, I appreciate that. And I think the modern mixed family is another layer of challenge over time. So other, do I see other hands, questions, comments? Great, great presentation, Rob. D Dave? I, have a comment. Uh, I just sent uh, my, my dollar for my birthday to the Rotary Club, and I uh, opened the envelope and put it, changed that to a six dollar check, so I could brag five dollars for Rob. Uh, he's uh, he's always been uh, magnanimous in his time, whether it's the uh, frisbee golf or the Pine Ridge or anything else, and I, I admire that in Rob. And I've never told him that, but uh, uh, we need more people like that in our world. I'm very grateful for what you are doing on this project as well. If I might add two thoughts without in any way detracting from what you're doing. One time at a Rotary meeting at the American Legion, Dr. Carolyn Taylor Olson spoke to us about a book, Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. I don't, I don't know how many of you were present when she gave that talk, but that book is about Atul Gawande's father last 24 months as he was physically failing. And it's written from the standpoint of a physician and how the body changes. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, and, and about how the quality of life is really, it, it's hard to put into words, but that really determines what do you want people to do as you fail? Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, talking point for a family discussion. A second thought in the same vein, <clears throat> uh, for probably 20 years, I was part of a dentist's uh, study club that met twice a year. The dentists were located along I-91 from Burlington to Brattleboro, different communities separated by 40, 50, 60 miles. And we met twice a year and we talked about life things, uh, not so much dentistry. And one of the meetings we had, I was in charge of the topic. We met for an, af an afternoon. And I just finished a book called I'm Not Much Baby, But I'm All I've Got, written by Jess Laird. It was an advertising executive in Chicago who had a heart attack at 42 and decided that life was crazy and it's not how he wanted to live his life. So he moved to Montana and raised sheep with his wife and three children. And it's the story of how it changed his life by force. But he was willing to look in the mirror and say, this isn't working for me. Uh, and one of the exercises he had in that book <clears throat> was to write your own obituary. Assume you're gonna die at 80. I say that now at age 77. He, he might've said, when you're 75, you're, you're, you're deceased. And, what do you want your obituary to say? And I remember the seven of us, the dentist, we were all about the same age, I'm guessing, and 50 years old. One of the members of the group, when it came turn to read your obituary, started to cry. This is one of the 10 most memorable, I get, cho I get choke up thinking about it now. And he said, 
I can't do it because I don't want people to remember me the way they would if I died. <clears throat> and none of us could speak for a while after he said that. But it, it deals with the experience of realistically looking at how you're living your life and how is that going to impact uh, the next five years, 10 years? How's that going to impact your family, your community? Uh, and I'll, I'm very grateful. I, I've rewritten that obituary uh, more than once since that book, just for myself, not to share, but uh, I, it was one way of forcing me to think uh, about how I spend my time as years went by. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for sharing that, David. I've, I recently uh, joined the board of Brattleboro Area Hospice, um, and they are running a program um, mostly for their volunteers right now, but I think they're going to roll it out to the community as well um, about writing uh, your legacy letter which is about, um, it's similar to what you were saying, David, in terms of writing your own obituary. It's a, it's a letter of, of what you want to share with people um, after, you, after you're gone. And it's a beautiful, beautiful um, format they have, very easy to follow and very, very nice. And it gets exactly to what I've been talking about too, which is you know, trying to remind ourselves what we want to focus on in our lives and what's important to us. So, hmm. Jennifer, you have your hand up. Well, took me a moment to get unmuted there. Um, yeah, first, th thanks to Rob. Um, I've already heard really good things about what you're doing and I can definitely relate since I'm simultaneously executive for both of my parents' estates right now. Oh, wow. And, um, I, I always think back to some of the stuff you said about planning who gets what and planning ahead is when my grandfather was still alive, he intentionally wanted my mother and her sisters to select things from his house ahead of time. And there were actually a whole bunch of pieces of furniture in the house that already had index cards taped to the backs of them with their names on them. And if two people wanted this, two or three people wanted the same thing, they would cut a deck of cards to decide who got what and after he passed away as they were dividing things up they continued to use that same system picking and cutting cards when they disagreed and it worked beautifully because they had all agreed on it 